Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to the Waymo Open Dataset session at the workshop on autonomous driving. My name is Zoe Young, and I'm from Waymo Research. I'm here to share about the datasets that we have built and to announce the winners of the Open Dataset Challenges. Many thanks to the workshop organizers for providing this platform. First, I'd like to give an overview of Waymo Open Dataset. Our team first launched the Open Dataset in August 2019, which includes our very first version of the Perception Dataset. In March 2020, we continued to expand the Perception Dataset and launched five challenges focused on percep perception tasks. We then announced the winners at last year's CDPR workshop. This year, in March 2021, we launched our Motion Dataset, which targets tasks like motion forecasting and planning. We launched four challenges this year to focus on perception and to focus on motion prediction. And now the challenges have concluded and we're here to announce the winners of this year's challenges. We're happy to share some stats on the open data set. So far, we have over 20,000 registered users for the open data set. And it has spurred over 200 publications from the talented research community. Our team is really happy to see that the data sets we have built have supported so much research. Our team's goal is always to contribute to the research community with one of the largest and most diverse autonomous driving data sets. And we also wanted to say thank you for all the amazing work you have done with Waymo Open Dataset. In case you don't know, here are the highlights of our data sets. Our perception data set has 1950 scenes at 20 seconds each. The sensor data are synchronized and wanted to be diverse, so we included scenes across different weathers and road conditions. Our motion data set is what we just released this March. We have three main ideas when building this data set. First, it should be big, so we included over 1,000 scenes in it. Second, it should be interesting, so we specifically mined for interactions when selecting leads from our driving log, and also include data from various regions. And third, it should be high quality and useful. We included 3D bonding boxes for each object and included 3D maps. The model that was used to generate the 3D bonding boxes is published. In our colleague's paper, Offboard 3D Object Detection, you can see it below, which is a paper right here at CDPR this year. Feel free to check it out if you're interested. Now let's talk about the challenges. Four challenges were held this year with two on prediction using our motion data set and two on perception using the perception data set. A quick note here, although the challenges have ended, the leaderboards will remain open for future submissions. We hope our data set and leaderboards will continue to serve the research community. So if you weren't a part of the challenges, feel free to check out the data sets and submit to the leaderboards anytime in the future. Before announcing the, uh, the winners, I would like to make another announcement on our data set. I'm happy to say that we will be releasing version 1.1 of the motion data set this summer. This version includes lane connectivity, such as lane neighbors, which is a very useful signal when it comes to predicting road agent behavior. And in addition to that, we're also making some map improvements. We're also always working to expand the open data set to contribute more to the research community. So please stay tuned for more updates on our data sets. Now let's go to the part that many people are waiting for, announcing the winners. Let's start with the perception challenges this year's perception challenges are modified a little bit from last year's with the latency constraint. This is to make the challenge a little more relevant to autonomous vehicles onboard use case. For this challenge, the task is to perform 3D detection of objects with a model that runs faster than 17 milliseconds on a NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPU. The methods are ranked by accuracy, which is mean average precision with heading. All right, coming to the winners. So the first place for this challenge is AFDET V2 from Yi Han Hu, Zhang Zhang Ding, Ren Zhou Ge, Wen Xin Shao, Yi Huang, Kun Li, and Qiang Liu. Congratulations to you all. This is fantastic work. The second place for the real-time 3D detection challenge is Centerpoint Plus Plus, and the authors are Tian Wei Yin, Qing Yu Zhou, and Philip Krahenbo. Great work. Congratulations to you. The third place for this challenge is X Autonomous 3D, and the authors are Lu Tian, Jin Zhang Peng, Rong Zhang Zheng, and Han Liu. Many congratulations, team. So for 3D detection challenge, there is another track with a different evaluation criteria. 
Although it is not eligible for winning an award, the model with the lowest latency and average precision, about 70%, will be given the special title of most efficient model. And the special title goes to the method AF Debt V2 Base, which is also from Yi Han Hu, Zhang Zhang Ding, Ren Zhou Ge, Wen Xin Shao, Li Huang, Kun Li, and Qiang Liu. Congratulations again on gaining this title. Let's move on to the next challenge, real-time 2D detection. The task here is very similar, perform 2D detection of objects with a model that runs faster than 70 milliseconds on a NVIDIA V100 GPU. So uh, the methods are ranked by accuracy, which is mean average precision. And the first place for this challenge is leap motor depth. The authors are Fenfen Wang, Tian Kun Xie, Lin Dong Li, Yao Nong Wang, Hong Tao Zhou, Han Xu, Yu Wang, Xiu Bo Ye. Congratulations, team, for winning this challenge. The second place is DD Map Vision, and the authors are Yu Ming Zhang, Xiao Lin Song, Bing Bai, Hong Fei Xin, Chao Liu, Jin Gao, Zhi Bui Wang, Ya Wen, Ya Wei Wen, uh, Hao Jing Liao, Guo Shan Zhang, Hong Fei Xu. Fantastic work. And congratulations to you all. The third place is um, Dearly Self Ensemble. And the author is Nikolai Zergivsky. Congratulations to you for winning the third place. OK, now let's take a look at the prediction challenges. For motion prediction, the problem definition here is that give the historical data of road agents, predict the positions of up to eight agents for eight seconds into the future. The main metric here is mean average precision, which is a metric that our team proposed and detailedly explained in our paper for motion data set. I will skip the definition for the sake of time, but please feel free to check out the paper and our website. Uh, let's go to the winners. So the first place for this challenge is Tsinghua Mars, since TNT. The authors are Jun Ru Gu, Xiao Sun, and Hang Zhao. This fantastic work and congratulations to you for winning this challenge. The second place method is Rico App. The authors are Xiao Yu Mo, Zhi Yu Huang, and Chen Lu. Great work. Congratulations, team. The third place goes to Simple CNN on Raster. The authors are Stepan Konev, Artyom Senekoyev, and Kiro Brat. Congratulations. Last but not least, the interaction prediction challenge. The task here is to predict joint future positions of two interacting agents, given the agent's historical data on a corresponding map. The main metric is also mean average precision, the same one as motion prediction challenge, but a little bit more generalized. The first place of this challenge is Heat IRM4, and the authors are Xiao Yu Mo, Zhi Yu Huang, and Chen Lu. Congratulations. Congratulations again to all the teams. You have done fantastic work. These teams have described their models and methods in their technical reports, which are now publicly available on this workshop's website at cdpr2021.wad.vision. So please feel free to check out these amazing reports. For all the teams that have submitted to the Open Dataset Leaderboards, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you for the work that you have put into this. Many more teams have very high quality work. All of us at Waymo Research are very impressed, and we're so happy to see the data sets we built leading to such great models. Many teams might be interested, uh, many people might be interested in hearing about these teams' methods. And now I will give the stage to some of these teams to talk about their models. We'll first have the first place for each challenge to present. And after that, we will have a special guest, David Wu, who is a student from Green Middle School to talk about his experience with open data set, although he could not be a part of this year's challenges. Now let's welcome the first team, AFDET V2 and their presenter, Tiang Liu. Turning it over to Tiang. Uh.
Hello, everyone. My name is Chang Liu. I'm glad to be here to present our solution uh, to the real-time 3D detection track in the Waymo Challenge this year. Uh, we won the first place uh, and also the title of the most efficient model. And uh, this is our team. Um, Zhang Zhuang Ding, Yi Han Gu, Ren Zhou Ge, Wen Xin Shao, Li Huang, and Kun Li. Uh, we're all from Horizon Robotics, and uh, we make uh, the software and hardware solutions for ADAs and autonomous driving. And this is uh, the outline for my talk. Um, I'm going to introduce the framework of our solution, um, some methods we use to improve the performance. So uh, our solution is an anchor-free single-stage model, uh, which is extended from our last year's model, AFDET. Uh, it has four uh, major components in this model, point cloud voxelization, uh, 3D feature extraction, region proposal network, and anchor-free detector. Uh, so the first step is the, uh, the voxelization. And for the uh, for the uh, voxelization, um, we take the mean value of all the points that falls in a voxel, and we do not limit the number of uh, points per voxel. In the second step, we use the sparse convolution to do the feature extraction. And uh, uh, we modified our last year's model to reduce the, the latency. For example, uh, at the early stage, we reduced the number of residual blocks. And uh, also for the Z axis, we do a down sample of eight instead of 16. And we found these tricks are effective to get a good trade-off between the network capacity and the latency. And the third step is the RPN, in which we used a self-calibrated convolution. So the main idea of this uh, self-calibrated convolution is to split the channels into different groups. And each group uh, going through different convolutions and also resolutions. So the resulted RPN has a larger receptive field and also can handle semantics better. And this is our um, detector, which is composed of seven subheads. So uh, of all the seven subheads, we have five heads, um, the same as our last year's model AFDET, which includes uh, heat map and the Z value, the 3D size, the orientation, and the offset. And uh, this year's model, we, we added two new subheads, which are the IOU prediction head and the key point uh, subhead. So the IOU prediction head would produce a, predict a, a IOU value, which is used to rescore the classification score and give us an IOU aware confidence. And this uh, subhead can effectively, uh, effectively deal with the uh, misalignment between the classification score and the localization maps. And for the uh, key point uh, subhead, we use it as a uh, auxiliary uh, supervision. Uh, it, is not, uh, it is not used for the uh, inference time. And for the losses, uh, we use the focal loss for the heat map and the key point auxiliary 
And uh, for the uh, IOU prediction, we use a smooth L1. And for all the others, we use L1 loss. And for further improvements, we use the point cloud densification. And this, in this case, we used only a previous, uh, uh, the previous frame, which is transformed to the current frame coordinate system to densify the point cloud. For data augmentation, we used both the global level and instance level augmentation. For the global, uh, we do the random rotation, scaling, and translation on the entire point cloud. And uh, for the instance level, uh, we do the rotation translation and uh, randomly manipulate, uh, copy and paste the instances to the point cloud. Okay, the final trick we used is, uh, it's called the stochastic uh, weight averaging, uh, in which we first get a baseline model trained and then uh, we keep training for five additional epochs. And in each epoch, we use a cyclic uh, schedule for the learning rate. And our final model is an average of these additional trained uh, checkpoints. Uh, and to improve the, uh, the latency, we uh, re-implemented the voxelization as we found that uh, voxelization, uh, voxelization is a bottleneck uh, for the uh, latency. Uh, so for each point, we, um, we accumulate uh, for each point to the corresponding voxel and we do the accumulation and counting uh, on GPU. And then for each point we have in this index for the voxel and this list of indices has uh, has duplicates because uh, many uh, because uh, some ob some points may correspond to the same voxel, and we do re remove the duplicates on CPU, and then we use this unique uh, list uh, of voxel in the index and gather and calculate the, the mean to form the sparse voxel, and this can give us about a 17 millisecond boost uh, for the overall inference. And here are uh, the results of our um, of our solution. And we provide we trained three models: uh, AFDET V2, the base, and the light. All three models use the same uh, network structure. And for the AFDET V2 and the base, we used the densification, which used two frames. And uh, uh, the other differences between these two models are the uh, number of training epochs and the grid size that we used. So uh, AFDET v2 got the highest uh, um, MAPH score and, and it runs at 60 milliseconds. And the base uh, runs at 55 milliseconds and uh, it, it won the, uh, uh, the most efficient title. Uh, and I, I'd like to mention that we, we have a, a light model which uh, can run much faster at uh, uh, 46 uh, milliseconds, but uh, the MAPH is uh, uh, 69.95, uh, which is uh, 0 0.05 uh, less than the required uh, 70 MAPH. Okay, uh, to compare the, um, the modifications uh, that we've done for the model, uh, we did a ablation study, uh, which include uh, the comparison between uh, with and without the IOU rescoring, and also the uh, key point supervision, the data augmentation, the self-calibrated convolution. Uh, and we found that uh, uh, with IO rescoring, we can get uh, the most significant, significant improvement. And uh, secondly, the uh, the self-calibrate convolution. So uh, it might be better seen from this uh, from this chart uh, that when use when use the self-calibrate convolution in the RPN, we have uh, about one one point uh, improvement, 
And uh, mm-hmm. on top of that, with the IOU branch, uh, we get almost a three point uh, improvement. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but we're running out of time. So okay. uh, just to remind you to wrap up with your presentation. Thank you. Okay. This is a visual display of the final result. And um, uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, summarize that uh, our AFDET V2 is a single stage anchor free model uh, extended from uh, our previous model. And uh, just uh, if we, we, we made a, a few modifications, but among which the most sig- significant one is the IOU aware branch, which uh, rescored the uh, classification score. Okay, and uh, uh, we thank uh, for all the prior arts based on which we made our, um, made our solution. Okay, uh, I'll stop, thanks. Thank you, Tian, for your presentation. Wonderful talk. And next, I will pass it on to Team Leap Motor Dead and their presenter, Fen Fen Wang. Okay, stop sharing. Hi everyone, this is Fen Fen Wang from Leap Motor Technology Company. It is my honor to be the speaker today. I'll present our 2D detection. This is a joint work with Chen Kun, Ling Dong, Yao Nong, Han Xu, Yu Wang, Xiu Bo, and Hong Tao. Basically, my presentation will be divided into three parts. At first, I'll be speaking about our motivations, then the methods we used, namely the three steps to do the experiment will be introduced. Lastly, I'll show our results submitted to test the dataset. The main reason that inspired us to do this job is that compared to last year, there's an added latency requirement that the model must run faster than 70 milliseconds per frame. So we try one stage detector at first. Now let's start with our methods. It is well known that Waymo Open Dataset is a very large dataset. We want to do more experiments. So for one thing, we extract 10% of dataset from chain and validation dataset to form a sub-chain and sub-validation dataset. For another thing, we adopt a small backbone ResNet-18. ATSS is adopted as a baseline detector. The training hyperparameters are almost the same as default hyperparameters to train Coco. Validation results are all in level two. Here, WAP means official Waymo official MAP, and CAP means Coco MAP. The baseline is trained on sub-train dataset and evaluated on sub-validation dataset. We focus on small boxes, which account for a lot of bounding boxes. Firstly, we add P2 feature map. As you can see from this picture, P2 is a green block we add. To make sure the flops wouldn't increase too much, we decrease FPN channel to 64. After adding P2 and the decreasing and the decreasing FPN channel, CAPS increased, obviously. Secondly, we use multi-scale training, which can increase CAPS by a large gap, and also WAP. Since the hyperparameters are referenced from COCO training, which is actually not very suitable for our task, we set initial learning rate higher and use cosine learning rate. This can also help increasing 
WAP. Then we compare ATSS to another three strong detectors, as shown in this table, GFLV2 performs best. However, the enhancement module of GFLV2 costs a lot of time, so we choose GFLV1 as our final one-stage detector. Considering the latency requirement, we choose a GPU-efficient backbone, VOVNet V2.39. Inference phase is running in half preceding floating point, that's FP16, and fills the batch normalization. The table shows the result submitted to test set. As you can see, latency time is 53.8 milliseconds. There's 16 milliseconds redundancy. What we to adopt a two-stage algorithm based on the former one-stage detector. You can see the network architecture here. We replace RPN with ATSS in faster RCN for providing proposals. Since ATSS is only for proposals, the regressed boxes don't need to be very accurate. Here's two modifications. First, we remove sentinel's branch. Second, heads for objectness and the regression are shared. We adopt a double head for our head. For final score, it's determined by objectness from RPN head and classification score from our head. This is experimental settings for two-stage detector. It's almost like previous settings. In this experiment, dataset for chaining is chain dataset, and we've evaluated on both sub-validation dataset and the validation dataset. Evaluation indicators don't differ, mu differ much on these two datasets. So in next experiment, the sub-validation sub will be evaluated. You may notice WAP of baseline here. Wait for the mouse. It's not exactly as same as the one I mentioned last slide. This one. That's because we applied fusing batch normalization and using half precision floating point to evaluation here. To further ask three strategies on inference stage. First one is calibration. Considering evaluation metrics, it's better for score distribution over classes to be softer. Temperature T is set to, t to two. Second one is per class NMS. WAP adopts different IOU thresholds for each class. Last but not least, we increase maximum out output boxes to 150. This is our final submission to test set. You can also see from the leaderboard or our technical report. Here are some strategies that don't work for us. In our head, we tried IOU balanced sampler and OHEM sampler. In our pooling, we changed feature map mapping level. And in inference, we tried soft NMS and box voting. We believe that two-stage detector can perform better than one-stage detector and also run faster by careful designing. Little effort has been put into inference of the model. We surely believe it could perform better with other inference tools like TensorRT. I'd like to thank Wemo for providing this challenge 
and the greatest thank goes to all the staff of, of Waymo Open Dataset who are very kind and helpful, replying questions very instantly and in details. And I would also thank our company. That's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fifa Wang, for your presentation. Um, and next, it would be Hang Zhao from Tsinghua Mars Dense TNT to talk about their model for motion prediction. OK, uh, I guess you can see my screen already. I, uh, hi, everyone. This is Han. I'm currently an assistant professor at Tsinghua University. It's a great pleasure to uh, meet a lot of friends here. And I would also like to thank all the organizers for putting this amazing challenge and uh, this amazing workshop together. I'm presenting our winner method called Dance TNT on behalf of our team. Uh, in our team, we have Jun Rugu, an undergrad student at Tsinghua University, and who is also an incoming PhD student of mine, and he did most of work here. And uh, Chao Sun, he's an intern in our lab, and myself. Okay, let's have a quick overview of motion prediction models. Uh, due to the stochastic nature of future, it is now more popular to predict multiple future trajectories in autonomous driving. And one of the popular classic method is uh, based on generative models. Uh, we have models like VAEs, GANs, and flows. And more recently, anchor-based models gain, has gained popularity. Anchor-based methods such as multipath and cover net, they use trajectory anchors. And the TNT, who you, uh, which used uh, goal-based anchors. And in our work, uh, we basically propose an anchor-free model called Dense TNT. And we'll go into details later. One of the prominent, prominent work in the trajectory prediction is TNT uh, proposed last year, where they decompose the trajectory predi prediction task into multiple interpretable and end-to-end -end trainable modules. First, they, uh, they encode the scene context to get the features and then to predict the, the goals. And finally, to complete the goals to form a trajectory. The intuition behind the TNT model is that the goal or the target, that is the end point of each trajectory, captures most of the uncertainty of, of a trajectory. So uh, instead of directly predicting the whole trajectory, it is easier and more straightforward to, uh, to estimate the probability and the location of the target. And our work is built on top of this. Uh, the one, character, one car characteristic of the TNT model design is that you use a sparse set of Go anchors from the map. As you can see, uh, these goals or targets are sampled from the center lines of the lanes. However, the sparse anchors bring a, a couple of issues. The first one, the first issue, one anchor can only generate one goal. So it is difficult to make multiple goal predictions around one anchor. Second, it cannot make use of fine-grained information on the road. For example, uh, it's hard to model the relative distance between an ordinary point position, uh, just an ordinary point on the, on the road and its relationship or its distance to the road boundaries. So we propose to use dense goal can candidates to improve the performance. And as you can see, comparing these two methods, the sparse candidates, uh, the sparse candidates only samples uh, very few numbers, uh, few number of few number of anchors as the as the goal candidates. And our dense candidates scoring methods try to sample all the points on the road so that we don't miss any locations on the road. This is very similar to uh, pixel-based object detection methods. Uh, we call our model dense TNT. It generates goals without using predefined anchors. And it, it encodes maps in a sparse to dense manner. I'll tell you how. 
And this is the, our model architecture. First, the model encodes the scene context, including the maps and the agents. And then it goes, uh, it goes through a sparse to dense encoding module to output dense probability on the map. The dense probability are, are about the goals of the trajectories. And finally, we have a trajectory completion module uh, so that we can get uh, we can get continuous and complete trajectories. And we split the uh, the whole architecture into four parts and explain them one by one. The first part is called the sparse context encoding. The, con the sparse context encoding, we directly get ideas from the paper called VectorNet, which, uh, which instead of encoding the maps as uh, rasterized images, uh, we encode them as vectorized lines and, poly uh, lines and polylines. And the second step is called dense code encoding. Basically, we get sparse features from the lanes on the maps. And then we use an attention module to get the features for each location on the map. And the next step is called dense probability estimation. It's basically for each location uh, on the map, we go from the features to its probability of being a goal of our interested agent. So after this step, we basically, we basically get a heat map of the goal probabilities. And the last step is called goal selection. We also fo uh, follow TNT using a non-maximum suppression method to select the final set of sparse goals. And the last step is a, a trajectory completion. We basically connect the, our targets and our starting point with a simple MLP neural network. Okay, and here are the results uh, uh, of the performance of dense TNT model. We first compared uh, its performance on the Argoverse motion forecasting uh, data set. Uh, this is a smaller data set, uh, which is easy, easier for us to compare and debug. The first row is the, uh, is, there's a take on the sparse, which is the classical TNT model. And the second row is our dense TNT model. And we can see that we can achieve an, a, a good improvement over the, uh, on the two metrics, mean FDE and the miss rate. Okay, and then the next problem is how to apply dense TNT onto the Waymo uh, prediction task. There's one issue that we have found challenging is, is about the long-term prediction. As we know in other data sets, the future prediction is usually about three seconds, which is uh, pretty short and goal-based methods perform really well. But we found that directly applying goal-based methods on these long-term predictions are not ideal. So uh, the reason is that um, the, the assumption behind TNT is that for each uh, prediction, as long as the goal is fixed, and our trajectories, as, lo as, long, or, as long as our goal is, is fixed, our trajectory is also fixed. However, for long-term prediction, for each goal, there could be multiple possible trajectories. So to deal with this issue, we basically apply an autoregressive goal prediction uh, method uh, to, to make the final predictions of uh, long-term prediction into the future, like eight seconds or even more. And here's the result of our dense TNT model on Waymo Open Dataset Motion Prediction Challenge. And we achieve a mean AP of 32.81, which is uh, very impressive on the leaderboard. And there's uh, uh, one drawback of our current model is that the mean FAD is not very good. And we, th uh, we think it's because that that's at the, dead, uh, at the deadline of our challenge, we did not have enough time to tune our trajectory completion module. And we believe that uh, with more efforts, it could be much better. And here's a breakdown on different categories uh, uh, of motion prediction. And we can see that uh, the cyclist uh, gives the lowest mean AP because we found that cyclist is the most, uh, 
it, it is really hard to handle. First, it's, it moves faster than pedestrians. And on the other hand, it does not always follow the lanes as the vehicles. And here are some visualizations of our results. And this is an interesting case of U-turn. The orange lines are our predicted trajectories and the green lines is the ground truth future tra trajectories. And then we show our uh, rollout prediction results over the time. And here is another interesting case where the vehicle turned into maybe a, a garage or a parking lot. And we can see that our model, uh, some of our models predictions follow the, uh, the, the curves and some, some others that go into the, going to the road. And here is another case of making turns at the intersection. And this is a, a, a big left turn at the intersection. We can, we can see that our predictions can make uh, predictions into different lanes. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Han, for your presentation. It's a wonderful talk. So we see some questions in the chat for both Zoom and for YouTube live stream for the teams that just presented. So just a reminder to those presenters at the session to check out those questions. And next we have Xiao Yu Mo for model Heat IRM4. Passing it on to you. Hello, I'm now sharing my window. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me here. My name is Xiao Yu. It's a great honor for me to introduce our solution to the Waymo Interaction Prediction Challenge. Our method is called Heterogeneous Edge Enhanced Graph Attention Network. First of all, I would like to introduce our team and our research lab. Our team consists of three people, me, Zhi Yu, and the director of our lab, Professor Chen Liu. Our lab is called Automated Driving and Human Machine System Lab, or in short, Automan. Our lab is called Automated. Uh, we mainly focus on autonomous driving and uh, human machine collaboration. Our research topics fall into three categories, human-like autonomous driving, human machine collaboration and human in the loop learning. We are dedicated to fielding machine learning with classic methods like planning and control to deliver a human-centered and a collaborative autonomous driving system. Now let's go uh, to our method and we'll first explain the, explain the data processing. Our task is to predict the possible joint trajectories of two interactive agents eight seconds into the future, and the probabilities of these trajectories. The information we have is the historical states of the target agents in the past one second, as well as the trajectories of the surrounding vehicles. We also have the detailed road graph, which we have processed as bird's eye view images. Specifically for each target agent in a scenario, we translate its states into a local coordinate system. The region is placed as the target at the target agent's current position, and the horizontal axis is aligned with the agent's current heading. The local image is rotated accordingly, and we uh, the historical states up to fourteen surrounding agents are also placed in their exclusive coordinate systems. We also construct an interaction graph of the agents to model their interactions. Now let's get to the 
HEAT method. After pre-processing, we get three types of inputs, historical states, interaction graph, and the local map. The left column shows agents' historical states, where our target agents are in green and blue. And the agents in orange are the surrounding agents. For each considered agent, its historical states is the sequence of its, its position, its positions, velocity, and your angle over the last one second placed in its uh, its own exclusive coordinate system. The interaction graph shows in middle is constructed with close connections, where each node represents an agent and the directed edge from node J to node I indicating that node J is a neighbor of node I, and it impacts the behavior of node I. The directed edges are assigned with edge attributes and types. Attributes of an agent from J to I contains relative measurements between node J and node I. That is the relative position, the node type, and the relative position, the relative velocity, and the relative yaw angle. Edge type from J to I contains concatenated node, node type of the source node and the target node. In our case, the node type is an indicator vector. We also have the local map on the right side. With these three kinds of inputs, we design an encoder decoder architecture with three encoding channels and two decoders. That's been from the dynamics encoder. The dynamics encoder is implemented with a GRU network. The dynamics encoder is shared across all the all agents, it extracts dynamics features from each agent's individual historical states. The dynamics feature is shown a bar with dots. We seek the dynamics feature of target agents for later use. We then assign dynamics features of each agent to its corresponding node in the interaction graph as node feature. We design a heterogeneous edge enhanced graph attention network, in short, we call it HEAT. To model the interaction among heterogeneous agents, the designed HEAT will be introduced in the next slide. The HEAT network models all agents' interaction with their neighbors in parallel, but we only save the light of the target agent for this task. Interaction features is shown in bar of stars. We also design a rotation sensitive map encoder for the local map of target agents. The map encoder is a simple three layer CNN without max pooling operations. The encoded map feature is shown in bar of squares. In the decoding part, we jointly consider these three kinds of features to predict multimodal trajectories with assigned probabilities. The joint feature of agent one is sent to shared multimodal RSM decoder. Then the decoder produces four possible future trajectories of agent one, the same for agent two. Predicted trajectories of agent one and agent two are paired as indicated by the numbers. The F1 in green is paired with F1 in blue as the joint prediction of model one. The concatenation of joint features of both agents are fed to a multi-layer perception to estimate the probabilities of the predicted trajectory pairs. P1 is the estimated probability of model one. Let's see the design the HEAT layer. The design heterogeneous edge enhanced graph attention layer mainly have three steps. It first transform the node feature, edge feature, and uh, node feature, edge attribute, and edge type to a higher dimensional space. The edge enhanced mask attention mechanism then calculates the attention coefficients using transformed features. For the edge J to I, we combine edge attributes and edge type as the edge feature, and the concatenation of edge feature and the node feature as edge enhanced node, node feature. Then the designed mask attention is applied to node I's neighborhood to estimate the importance of its neighbors. 
Finally, node i feature is updated by aggregating add attributes and node features from its neighborhoods. We also support multi-head attention for aggregation. More details about the HAD layer, please refer to our preprint on archive. This page shows the performance of our method on the test set comparing the LSM baseline. You can see that the proposed method improves the baseline in terms of matrix. Details about metrics can be found on the web page of Waymo Open Dataset. We also realized our methods prediction results for vehicle vehicle interaction, vehicle cyclist interaction, and vehicle pedestrian interaction. We can see that the proposed method is able to predict the joint future trajectory of two highly interactive agents, no matter whether no matter they are. Uh, vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to cyclist or vehicle to pedestrian. Okay, that's all for our methods. Thank you. Thank you, Xiaoyu, for your presentation. Fantastic work. Thank you for sharing. So our last presenter for this session is a special guest. His name is David Wu, and he is a seventh grade student. Although he was not able to enter the challenges, his submission air squared ranked highly on the Interaction Challenge leaderboard. And now let's welcome David to talk about his team's method. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is David, and I'm a middle school student, so uh, I'm not eligible for the competition. Uh, but we built a model that would have uh, ranked first place in the Interaction Prediction Challenge. Uh, and I would like to thank Waymo for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, and uh, But before I begin, I'd like to first describe the key ideas behind a uh, typical motion prediction approach, since the problems of interaction prediction and motion prediction are closely related. So uh, a typical motion prediction approach is the multipath approach. Uh, so the model takes in an image centered at the ego agent and runs it through CNN in order to get a set of trajectories and confidences that correspond to anchor trajectories, uh, which we can obtain through k-means clustering. Uh, for example, one of these might correspond to turning right, one might correspond to turning left, uh, et cetera. And then during training for each example, the anchor assignment of the ground truth trajectory is calculated and uh, for example, suppose the ground truth says that the car went right and our model predicted it with probability 0 0.1. Then the weights in the model would be tweaked through SGD uh, and then maybe now it predicts it with probability 0 0.2 uh, and predicts a trajectory slightly closer to the ground truth trajectory. So we repeat this process um, millions of times on a large data set and boom, the neural network figures it out. Um, so now let's get back to the problem of interaction prediction. So for interaction prediction, um, our model takes in an image centered at one of the interacting agents with both interacting agents colored in green. Uh, and we feel that this is enough information for uh, the model to make predictions while considering interactions, uh, since it can figure out which agents it needs to predict and then use the rest of the information in the scenario in order to make uh, educated predictions while considering interactions. So the model takes the image and runs it through CNN and it gets a confidence matrix instead of a confidence vector like for motion prediction. Uh, each grid cell corresponds to an anchor for the ego agent and an anchor for the other agent. So for example, one of these might correspond to agent zero going right and agent one going left and another one might correspond to agent zero stopping, agent one going forward, uh, et cetera. So we can get this grid for both agents uh, by running both images, each centered around one of the interacting agents through our model. Uh, and then we transpose the second grid in order to make the two grids consistent and from one agent's perspective. Uh, and then we can average them, which creates a natural ensembling effect since we're averaging two predictions uh, from different perspectives. So during training, uh, for each example, the anchor assignments of the ground truth trajectories are calculated. And then, um, for, uh, for example, suppose the ground truth says that uh, the vehicle went right and the pedestrian went forward, uh, and our model predicted it with probability 0 0.05. Then the weights in the model will be tweaked through SGD, uh, and maybe now it uh, predicts it with probability 0 0.07. So uh, this slide essentially captures the key idea behind our approach. And, um, you can see that it's really similar to our approach for motion prediction. And 
Uh, in addition, you can also think of it as a 2D extension of multipath. So now you may be asking, that covers the confidences, but how do we get our trajectories? So for trajectories, we uh, take the simplest approach possible. We just take the two sets of trajectories that we can obtain uh, by running both images, each centered on one of the interacting agents through our model. And then we just take a Cartesian product in order to get uh, our matrix of trajectories. So now having covered the key ideas, let me jump into the boring details. So our motion prediction model is named AIR, but why is it named AIR? So AIR stands for three things. So A stands for anchored, uh, meaning that our model predicts a set of trajectories and confidences that correspond to anchor trajectories, which we can obtain through clustering. In addition, predictions are supervised based on the anchor assignment of the ground truth. Uh, this breaks our problem down into intent classification and regression given intent, and also introduces a clean division of responsibility, since each mode is only responsible for predicting the trajectory and confidence that correspond to its anchor. I uh, stands for interpolated, meaning that our model predicts uh, eight control points instead of full 80 time step trajectories. Uh, these control points are then splined to get our full 80 time step trajectories. Uh, and the intuition behind this is that we as humans know that trajectories have to be smooth. And then using splining helps encode that knowledge into our model. Uh, and we can implement this easily using tensorflowgraphics.maths.interpolation.bspline. R stands for rasterized. Um, so our model is a rasterized model, and we feel that rasterization is an intuitive way to take all relevant information about a scenario and place it onto one single input that we can directly feed to our model. Uh, as the old saying goes, an image is worth 16 by 16 words. And then um, in addition, these images are human interpretable. They actually make sense. So we as humans can look at the image on the screen and figure out what's going on. So machines can do it as well. So this is basically a detailed version of what I covered on slide two, but the only details that I would like to point out are first of all, that we have uh, separate per object type heads after shared FFN. Um, and the intuition behind this is that different object types behave very differently. And this allows our model to specialize in all of them while avoiding competition and parameter learning driven by different object types. Uh, in addition, clustering is done separately based on object type. Uh, again, the intuition is that different object types have different overall behaviors. And then inside a head, we add the centroid for each anchor to our prediction, uh, which makes our model predict the residual and helps us avoid a hockey stick-like learning curve. And then lastly, predictions are transformed into world coordinates uh, since our model has been working in ego coordinates uh, up until now. So this is basically a detailed illustration of what I outlined on the interaction prediction in nutshell slides. Uh, but again, the only detail that I would like to point out is that we have separate per object type heads after a shared FFN. And again, the intuition is that uh, different object types behave differently. So we consider two main representations in our solution. Um, the first of them has both interacting agents colored green and is centered around one of them, as you can see on the left. Uh, and the other one has a re-rasterized trajectory for the other agent, as you can see on the right. So for re-rasterization, we take the top prediction output by a motion prediction model for the other agent and draw it onto the image before feeding it to our model. So the intuition behind this is that we're giving the model some hints about what other agents in a scenario are doing. And it's kind of similar to how human drivers think, because like when I'm crossing the street, I can visualize what other agents are doing and modify my actions accordingly. So one of the other feature of our, uh, features of our solution is how we deal with data imbalance. So um, we train on a custom data set created by sampling from separate vehicle, pedestrian, and cyclist data sets with equal probability. Uh, and we can implement this easily using tf.data.experimental.sample from data sets. And then also we have a regression loss and we have a classification loss, but we need to figure out how to weight them. Uh, and a simpler approach to determine these weights would be through trial and error, but that would take too much time and require too much computational resource. Uh, so we created an empirical method that we call metric loss sensitivity analysis that allows us to determine these weights efficiently. So what we do is we partially reveal to the model the correct trajectories or confidences using the equations at the bottom of the slide, where alpha is a small positive constant like 0.1, p refers to the confidence vectors, and x to the trajectories. We then measure the decrease in loss and the corresponding change in MAP when we reveal the trajectories versus the confidences and weight our regression and classification losses to generate a similar amount of MAP for the same decrease in classification loss versus regression loss. 
And this helps us avoid a scenario in which we're spending a lot of uh, time and energy trying to decrease the regression loss to get a small boost in MAP when we could have decreased the classification loss by a small amount to get a bigger boost in MAP. Um, so in conclusion, we developed a solution that we call air squared um, that uses rasterized images to, uh, wait, uh, sorry. Um, so uh, here are the results. Um, so for submissions, we ensembled four models and also trained on the first 100 files of the validation data set. Um, and we're currently conducting an ablation study, but we have not completed it yet due to time constraints and also constraints on computational resources. But we will post our ablation results uh, to our GitHub repository after we release our code. So in conclusion, uh, we developed a solution that we call Air Squared, which uses rasterized images to predict uh, joint probabilities in the anchor Cartesian product space. And then for trajectories, we just take a simple Cartesian product of the two sets of trajectories from a marginal model that we obtain by running both images through our model. And then this gives us our matrix of trajectories. So in the future, uh, we could explore um, extending our solution to using TNT as motion prediction uh, for motion prediction, uh, uh, as since we learned about it yesterday and we feel that it's a strong approach for uh, motion prediction. Um, and TNT breaks the problem down into where do you want to go and how we'll get there, and we can apply our squaring technique to the where do you want to go part. Um, and then in addition, in addition, we could explore ways to model interactions between all agents in a scene, um, and that would help our model better understand the environment as a whole. Uh, and then we will share our code after the conference um, at our GitHub repository that you can see at the bottom of the slide. Okay. So thank you for listening to our presentation. Um, feel free to email me at the email on the slide if you have any questions. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, David. This is a great presentation. Thanks again to all the presenters for sharing your methods. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I will turn it over to Alex and the workshop organizers for the next session.